I'm John Hutala, Market Executive and Chair of our Market Leadership Team for JPMorgan Chase here in Syracuse. JPMorgan Chase is proud to be presenting sponsor this year for the White Ribbon Campaign. In addition to my role with JPMorgan Chase, I've also proudly served on the Vera House Board for the last four years. I'd like to thank Vera House for organizing this evening's event to kick off this year's White Ribbon Campaign and for all the work they continue to do to create a world that is free of violence and abuse. The White Ribbon Campaign is about raising awareness and refusing to be silent about domestic and sexual violence. I wear the White Ribbon to stand up against abuse of all forms and to be an example for my three daughters. I wear the White Ribbon to show my support of the fantastic work the Vera House staff and others are doing to make our community safer for everyone. I wear the white ribbon for Honorary Chair Marissa Saunders for her strength through vulnerability and for helping me find my voice in the anti-racism work we're doing at Vera House. For the next 30 days, my colleagues and I at J.P. Morgan Chase will be wearing our white ribbons proudly reaffirming the pledge to do our part in ending domestic and sexual violence. While the campaign runs through the end of the month, it's important that people continue to carry its values into their daily lives throughout the year. Despite being unable to walk side by side in Clinton Square for the White Ribbon Walk this year, I know the level of support for what this campaign stands for remains as strong as ever. It's up to us to engage, educate, and empower. Together, we can all make a difference. Thank you to everyone who's in attendance tonight, and thank you to Vera House for leading this year's White Ribbon Campaign. Welcome to the Vera House Foundation White Ribbon Campaign Breakfast. I'm George Kilpatrick, Project Coordinator for the Engaging Men Program, and I'm very pleased to be with you to kick off the 27th Annual White Ribbon Campaign with our virtual breakfast for dinner. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to support Vera House's work to end domestic and sexual violence. And we're here this evening for a very important purpose to support the White Ribbon Campaign and Vera House, which we will recognize throughout the month of March. Many of you have come to this event in the past when it has been an in-person breakfast and we've been able to be in community with one another. We thank you for continuing to be loyal supporters of the White Ribbon Campaign, even now that the event and the campaign are looking a little different. Some of you are new to the campaign and its message that there's no excuse for abuse in any relationship. We hope you take the White Ribbon Campaign pledge to heart. And when you wear a ribbon or slip on a wristband or face mask, you're making an important statement that you will not support, commit, or remain silent about domestic or sexual violence. In this unique and often challenging year, your support is worth more than ever. Your participation today illustrates that you're a part of the White Ribbon Movement, the world's largest movement of men and boys working to end violence against women and girls. It's a movement that promotes gender equity, healthy relationships, and a new vision of masculinity that inspires men to understand the incredible potential they have to be a part of positive change. It's a movement based on safety, love, and respect. Our community has created one of the largest white ribbon efforts anywhere in the world. We owe the success of this effort to each and every one of you. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank all of our underwriters. They are as follows. Presenting sponsor, J.P. Morgan Chase, Housel Dermatology, MNT Bank, Wegmans, CNS Companies, Community Bank, DeFrancisco Falgitano Personal Injury Lawyers, Empower Federal Credit Union, Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield, Key Bank, King and King Architects, National Grid, Northland Communications, Onondaga Community College Foundation, Parsons McKenna Construction Company. Syracuse University, Tessie Plastics, and Destiny USA. Thank you all for your support 
of our work to end domestic and sexual violence and elder abuse. I would also like to acknowledge a special group of people that work so hard behind the scenes to lead the White Ribbon Campaign in our community. Brian Conkle and James Branch, the campaign co-chairs, and the White Ribbon Campaign Steering Committee is the driving force behind the momentum you see here today. The committee has worked tirelessly this year to shift the campaign into a virtual space and continue to raise awareness and necessary funds on behalf of Vera House. Without their help, events like today's would not be possible. The White Ribbon Campaign began after a lethal attack on a group of women at L'Ecole Polytechnique in Canada in 1989, specifically Montreal. That December day, the attacker asked all of the men in the room to leave. Each man filed out, leaving the women vulnerable and alone. When the men left, 14 victims were killed. An additional 14 were injured by a man who did not think women belonged in engineering. And by the way, he had a list of other women he planned to kill. In response, a group of men in Ontario took it upon themselves to begin a movement highlighting that men needed to do more to support the safety of women, and they pledged that they would not react like the victim's male colleagues in the building that day. They would never support, commit, or remain silent when they saw abuse being perpetrated against women, pledging that day to give up their arms. Today, we continue their legacy with your participation in the White Women Campaign. You're telling members of our community that they're not alone in the fight for their safety and their lives. You're telling them that they can count on you to fight with them and for them. And for that, we thank you. We are thrilled to share the White Ribbon Campaign message in new and creative ways. This year, in partnership with local businesses at different times throughout the month of March, you will find a White Ribbon Campaign sticker with a scannable QR code on your coffee sleeve or sandwich wrapper at Blue Tusk, Eva's European Sweets, Finger Lakes Roasters and Coffee at Destiny USA, Funkin' Waffles, Glaze and Confused, The People's Place Cafe at Hendrix Chapel, Pepino's, Pie Guys Pizzeria, Chapper's Pizza Pub, and Wildcat Pizza Pub. We are grateful that these businesses are sharing the important White Ribbon Campaign message with their customers. The stickers would not be possible without the generous support of our friends at Syracuse Label and Surround Printing. Thank you to Vera House Foundation Trustee Kathy Alemo, President of Syracuse Label, for partnering with us to make the stickers. As you have witnessed today and have seen throughout the years, achieving our mission or creating a world free of violence and abuse is achievable, but it takes a community. There are so many of us ready to create an equitable and safe world. I do hope that you are ready and please help us create a beloved community, community that no longer remains silent or tolerates abuse. Thank you. I'd now like to present a special video from our friends at Solon Quinn Studios, featuring this year's White Ribbon Campaign Honorary Co-Chairs, Dr. Imad Rahim and Marissa Saunders. Imad is a genocide survivor and refugee of the Khmer Rouge killing fields of Cambodia. He's also an author, Katuk Family Endowed Professor, and a chair at Bellevue University and CEO at Zuntudium. Marissa Saunders is a victim and survivor of both domestic and sexual violence, vice president of the Vera House Board, and is the founder and facilitator at Nurturing Individuals Abilities, NIA Ministries Worldwide. She is also Vera House's first ever female identifying honorary chair. Let's watch. My story is honestly deeply bedded in violence. Violence was in my home, whether intentionally or unintentionally, and it was generational, I believe. So my, my life consisted of me surviving from a young age until, you know, honestly, maybe only just a few years ago. I stopped having to survive or feeling like I had to survive. So my life 
was about protecting myself and trying to find a way to love myself. The violence, both domestic violence and sexual violence against me, my body, my mind, my emotions, caused me to stumble a lot in life and caused me to not know who I really was and didn't know what my purpose really was. Through it all, through everything, I still firmly believe in love. I've had to redefine it over the years. I think that's possibly, and I can only speak for myself, I didn't understand it fully. And I had a wrong definition, and I only had the definition that I knew that I'd seen, that I'd heard, I, I only knew that. As I grew, as I healed, I learned how to redefine it for myself and understand that the pain that sometimes comes with love, because even in love there's hurt sometimes, your feelings get hurt, but it doesn't mean that I need to physically be hurt. It doesn't mean that I need to emotionally be hurt. It doesn't mean that I have to be so wounded that my heart is broken into pieces. So redefining love has been important for me. I think generationally, if we go back into the black community, those words weren't always spoken to a mother, to a daughter. They weren't always spoken. And so I, I'd want my mother to hear from her mother, I love you. I would want my father to know and hear from his mother the same exact thing, I love you. The violence that I went through, I went through it, but it doesn't define me. It doesn't mean that's all of who I am. It's a part of a wonderful story that I call my life that I'm still writing chapters to. And the chapters that's been written before, I use them. I use each and every one of them to take with me everywhere I go so that it finds a place in, in others that gives them strength, that provides strength for them to know that it doesn't have to just be one chapter or the end. I'm on my second book of my life. I have two children, I have two daughters. One will be 30 this year and one will be 24 this year. And I want what I've always wanted from the time they were in my womb is for them to find their purpose, their calling and to pursue it with everything in them. People are born to love. We come into this world with love. And when I see a baby or a small child, it reminds me of that each and every time, that the beautiful thing about this world is the love. Many people don't know this about me, but I am a domestic violence survivor. When I was 13 years old, about 12 turning 13, uh, my stepfather came home. Uh, we found out you know, that he was, he was fired from his job. He came into my room and he told me that the reason why he lost his job is because I was bad luck and that he would, uh, that he would kill me that he would kill me in my sleep because I was bad luck. And I felt like he would. So that day, you know, when he went into his room, I packed up my book bag, put some clothes in there. I think I had probably $40 and I ran away. 
At the age of 13 or, or 12, I was homeless for, for two weeks, wandering Syracuse. And then I eventually uh, ended up at my sister, my older sister's house. And after being with them for about two years, I got into a fight with my uncle. And uh, in that fight, he, uh, he, you know, he told me something that changed my life. And he, he, he basically told me that, that, first off, that I was a bastard. Uh, during this time, I thought my stepfather was my biological father, right? So I had no idea that this man that was abusing me, threatening me, abusing my siblings, was really my stepfather and not my biological father. My, my, my father was, was, uh, was tortured and executed in a concentration camp in the killing fields of Cambodia. And it changed how I saw my living condition and, and my situation, so I went back home and went to stay with my mother because I felt like I could protect her, I could do something about this. And when I came back, a fight broke out between uh, between my mother and my, my stepfather. And uh, during that, that argument, I kept on saying, let's, let's leave, you know, let's just leave together. Let's, let's take my, my brother and sister and let's just leave him. We don't, we don't need him. You know, we, we can leave tonight. He looked at me, he looked at her and he, and he, and he was like, how, how dare you disrespect your father? How dare you disrespect me? <laughs> and I, I looked back at him and I was like, you're not my father. I know who my father is now, and you're not my father. And my mother's face went pale, because she had no idea that I knew now. And I mean, before I could blink, he charged at me. And as he swung and went to hit me, my mother jumped right in front of it. And he ended up knocking her out cold. And it, it felt like like everything went in slow motion. All of a sudden, I just remember being on top of him and I was just just swinging and punching and, and I was screaming and crying. And then on the corner of my eye, I, I, I saw my, uh, my little brother and sister and they were at the doorway and all I could see was I'm on top of their father and there's blood everywhere. And then my mother, she got up and she pulled me off of him. And he, he got up, he went to the kitchen, and I could hear the drawers opening, and he comes back into the living room. And he has like two large butcher knives. And he's standing, you know, uh, right in front of me, next to my mother and my siblings behind me. And all I could think of was like, you know, how do I protect my mother in this? How, what can I do? And all of a sudden he, he, he sits down on the couch in the living room. He put the knives down right on the coffee table and he just starts laughing. Like just the, the craziest, scariest laugh I've, I've ever heard. So I, I, I pushed my, my, my siblings into their room, closed the door, and ran outside and called the neighbors and, uh, and used their telephone to call the police. And after years and years of abuse and, uh, and trauma, he was arrested. And, uh, and we haven't seen him since. And that was about I mean, that was over 30 years ago. I, I don't blame you for being with my stepfather this, that long. You know, I, I, as, as a kid, I, I know that we, we had our ups and downs. As a teenager, I was not the, the best, I was not the best example of a son but I, I love you. And everything that I have accomplished in life, down to the person I've become, it's because of you. It's because of the journey that you had to take in order to keep us safe. 
and I know that you made a lot of sacrifice to keep us safe. And you did what you have to do to, uh, to make sure that we were taken care of. And that's, you know, that stuck with me. You know, it's the same reason why I think my work ethics, how I value my family, how I treat my wife and, and my daughters is because how you treated us. So I, I, I just want you to know that, you know, that, that I'm very proud of you. And I, I, I fully understand now why you had to make the decisions that you made. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Imad and Marissa for sharing your story. And thank you to the team at Solon Quinn Studios for another amazing video. I now have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Don McPherson. Don was an All-American quarterback at Syracuse University and is a veteran of the NFL and Canadian Football League. He is also the author of You Throw Like a Girl, The Blind Spot of Masculinity, which chronicles 36 years of harnessing the power and appeal of sport to address complex social issues and focuses on a quarter century of work in gender-based violence prevention. Following his illustrious football career, Don turned his focus to the issue of men's violence against women. He has conducted workshops and lectures advocating for the prevention of sexual and domestic violence for more than 350 college campuses, community organizations, and national sports and violence prevention organizations. His programs and lectures have reached more than 1 million people. Last year, Don was gracious enough to be our keynote speaker at our White Ribbon Kickoff Breakfast and has returned today to share why the White Ribbon Campaign and its message remains so important to him. Don? Hello, my name is Don McPherson, and it's an honor to be back with Vera House for this year's Breakfast for Dinner. It's also a pleasure to be here to introduce our next speaker, Eric McGriff. The theme of this year, Next Man Up, comes from the world of sports about the next man stepping into the job, ready to go when called upon. Honestly, I never thought of that when I played the game of football many years ago, but I did play in a way that I hope inspired young boys to want to play to be a good steward of the game, promoting the positive impact of the experience beyond the sport. That to me is the meaning of Next Man Up, not waiting for the next man to come along, but inspiring the next man into action. In 1994, when I retired from seven years of professional football, I met and worked with my mentor, Jackson Katz. I was 29 years old and for the first time in my life, I was asked to examine my understanding of masculinity and its links to all forms of men's violence against women. While Jackson taught me so much, what he actually did was tap into the parts of my, my masculinity that as feminist scholar Bell Hook says, I learned to kill off in myself. So part of living my wholeness was not just executing the job of being a social justice educator and advocate, but being a positive loving steward for what I now refer to as aspirational masculinity, inspiring men to live their whole loving authentic selves. When I met Eric McGriff and his brother, there were students at Syracuse University, and I immediately thought of myself when I met Jackson Katz. But there were some big differences. Number one, they were 10 years younger, at least, than I was when I met Jackson Katz. The other thing was that they were in college, and they were already living their authentic selves. And Eric was that example of a young man in the midst of a college environment that was asking him many ways to kill off that, uh, that part of his masculinity. But he was truly living his whole authentic loving self and he was seeking ways to inspire other young men to live that way. He was so far ahead of where I was at that age and I was so proud and inspired by him. And I do believe that because of young men like Eric, that the next generation won't just be the next man up, but it'll be the next generation up. So it was my pleasure and my honor to introduce Eric McGriff. Hey y'all, my name is Eric McGriff. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I am the prevention coordinator for the Crime Victims Treatment Center in New York City. 
You all, however, might think I look a little familiar because you may have seen me in the Vera House orbit once or twice, you know, at an event or two in the last maybe decade, maybe, maybe. Uh, if you do I think I look familiar, you are absolutely correct. Uh, I have been connected to Vera House since I was in high school at Cicero North Syracuse High as a part of CNS's Honor Society's White Ribbon Campaign to Engage Men and Boys in Ending Domestic and Sexual Violence Against Women and Girls. Whew. I was co-chair of that campaign with my identical twin brother, Anthony, who you all might also think I look familiar because of. It's okay. Uh, if you get us confused, it's part of being a twin. Um, the White Ribbon Campaign was something that when it came to my brother and I was something that was you know, super exciting and something that was really meaningful to us at the time. Um, it, it sort of came to us in a funny way though. Uh, the, the chairman before us were identical twin boys, the Kurtz twins. Love them, hope you all are doing well. If you see this, hope you all will still find ways to do the work as well. Um, but the Kurtz twins, one of them pulled me aside after an honor society meeting, asked me if my twin brother and I would be interested in being the new co-chairs. I said yes for both of us. I asked Anthony, he said yes. Uh, and then we were out here, right? We we're uh, here to be a part of this campaign uh, that spoke to us because it spoke to experiences uh, that, that, you know, uh, really resonated with us and, and what we had witnessed and experienced growing up. My brothers and I grew up in a home where we were exposed to and, and witnessed, you know, some really unhealthy and abusive relationships and relationship dynamics affecting multiple women that we care about. And during those times, we didn't know what to do. We didn't know what to say, right? We were, you know, young men who were supposed to be tough and strong and standing up for women, but at the same time, weren't and were sort of afraid to and sort of didn't really know how to. And this is when it was impacting folks that we do care about. And so the White Ribbon Campaign really provided an opportunity for us to have a conversation that we have been a little afraid to have before this. It provided an opportunity to learn about the shame and the blame and the embarrassment that should not be felt by survivors and co-survivors. Um, and it helped us get rid of that shame after we acknowledge it so that we could begin our healing journey. The White Ribbon Campaign uh, was important for us uh, because it really did provide a space for us to talk about and learn about things that we didn't get in any other place. And so I was incredibly lucky to be at a school that had a partnership with Vera House to provide this kind of uh, programming. I was also extremely privileged not just to work with Vera House uh, in high school, but to also work at Vera House as a prevention educator in the prevention education department. As a prevention educator, I worked with the alternatives program, doing work with men who batter. I worked in K through 12 schools. I worked on the white ribbon campaign. I worked with community uh, organizations that partnered with Vera House, and it was an absolute blast. I mean, to, to work in a prevention department that is as big and provides as comprehensive uh, of a support package as Vera House does, it's something that I now know in my coordinator role does not exist in many other places. Uh, and, you know, it, it really speaks to uh, the, the flexibility and the support that Vera House has earned over the, over the past, you know, over 40 years, 40 something years that you've all been, been in existence. Um, and so, again, I just feel incredibly privileged to have worked at an organization that offers such comprehensive services that where I have been able to learn so much and has left me better off as now I am venturing off to do uh, prevention education work at an organization that has never done this work before. Wish me luck. Uh, but I want to get back to why we we're all here. We're all here to talk about what it means to engage men and boys, to inspire men and boys and male identified folks, I apologize, to be leaders and work to end sexual and relationship violence and gender based violence. And so I want to sort of speak to the male identifying folks in the room who might be trying to figure out what can I do. Um, so here are some of my suggestions. One. If you have access to a computer, a laptop, an uh, uh, iPad, uh, uh, a smartphone that has internet, internet access, Google, social media, use YouTube, right? 
use the resources that you have to learn about the issue, all right, to, to hear about stories and experiences of folks who are different than you, who to hear about the stories of survivors and to, you know, gain some tips on how to have these conversations. You can go to Rain. You can go to Scarlet Teen Online. You can go to TikTok now and find messages on how to be a bystander, on how to be an ally, on how to even engage men in ending domestic and sexual violence against women and girls. I promise you, um, it's probably the algorithm, but it, it randomly generates on all of my timelines for my social media. So look to what you have and do some kind of Google slash social media search to learn. You can also learn with Vera House. Uh, as a former prevention educator, I feel like I'm qualified in saying that Vera House has the number one prevention uh, program department and an amazing engaging men program that is there to offer support, offer education and training and help you coordinate campaigns and events. If you want to further this conversation, but don't necessarily know how to. Right? Just give them a call, send them an email and Vera House uh, can help you, you know, it, Figure out how we move forward on this conversation in a way that meets uh, your needs and respects your time and works for your space. Men, I, male identifying folks, I also want you to be gentle with yourselves. As we think critically about what it means to be a man in our society, part of what we may understand is that we have been exposed to harm that we haven't been allowed to address. Harm that we would uh, get made fun of for um, if we were to talk about. And we also might, you know, feel like we can freeze because of the guilt that we might feel because of how we may have engaged with um, women, you know, queer folks uh, in the past. We may have not known that we've caused harm and we might be realizing it. So again, be gentle with yourself and connect with other folks who are doing this work. Like folks like the folks at Vera House, folks like the uh, people in the engaging men department at Vera House who are well versed in having these conversations and making this space for you um, to help facilitate this really vulnerable change process um, of rethinking manhood and masculinity. I also would love the male identifying folks to be leaders in the form of challenging your boys, challenging your friends who are using racist, you know, sexist, transphobic uh, comments and gestures. With our friends, you know, there might be a safety for you all to speak up in ways that you don't feel safe uh, when it comes to, you know, strangers whose motives you don't know, whose responses uh, you might not uh, be able to as easily uh, predict as you might your friends. So maybe start this conversation with, you, with your friends. Right? And if it's not calling them out, maybe it can be a call in with something like, hey, why do we use that language? All right? I also want you all to listen to survivors. And when you listen to survivors, understand that two different things can be true at the same exact time. What you experience is not the only experience of every single person in the world, right? We all have different experiences, right? And all assets and facets um, of our lives, right? And so if we can understand that two people, what's safe for one person may not be what's safe for another person, and that both of those things can be true at the same time, right? We, we sort of, it, it, for me, it gives me a comfort, you know, and even if I don't know the answer to understand, okay, this is what's out here, right? This is what we're facing. This is what we're looking at. Instead of feeling, you know, insecurity that can come from the unknowns. I also want you all to, to maybe, no, to absolutely find opportunities to uplift and amplify the voices of women, of queer folks, of queer and trans people of color. One of the things about doing gender equity work is that even as a man in this field, you have privilege. You will be given opportunities. People will ask to pay you more. Uh, some people may even pay attention more because you look the way that you do, because maybe you are identified as a male, you know, by the folks that you are talking to. And so how do you use that privilege? How do you use that privilege to make space for your co-facilitator, who might be a woman, uh, for, your, for your colleague, right? For other survivors in the room in a way uh, that is within your capacity. Think about these things. Maybe start to uh, implement one of these things, even if it's you know, the Google search right now to look for resources or an email or a call to Vera House right, to schedule a, a education session. If we can do some of these things, we'll be on a really good path to starting conversations and creating spaces where men and boys can feel comfortable 
speaking up about, talking about, you're being bystanders in situations where domestic and sexual violence are uh, in, involved. They can also be allies in the work that is needed to redefine masculinity and create healthier men um, who are allies in this work to prevent and respond to domestic and sexual relationship violence. I hope you all are well. I hope you all have a great rest of your evening. And I look forward to uh, coming back to Syracuse and seeing what's good with y'all soon. All right. Be well. See y'all later. Bye. Hi, my name is Brian Conkle. I serve as Dean of Hendricks Chapel here at Syracuse University, and I am proud to be Vera House's next man up. Growing up in central Wisconsin, I was fortunate to be raised, taught, and mentored by a collection of amazing men. I was taught how to be a man. I was taught compassion, courage, and how to care for something larger than myself for the sake of something grander than myself. And now as a father, as a pastor, as a teacher, my hope and my prayer is that we can work alongside Vera House to create a world that is free of domestic and sexual violence. Thank you for joining me in this cause. I'm proud to be Vera House's next man up because I so believe in the outstanding work of the staff and management who provide such vital services to our community. I truly believe there is absolutely no excuse for abuse, and the world will be a much better place if we all simply embrace the golden rule and do unto others as we would have them do unto us. I, Dr. Douglas Halliday, am proud to be Veer House's next man up. As a member of the National Domestic Violence Project and a facial plastic surgeon, I have been fortunate enough to treat victims of domestic abuse with pro bono surgical services. I have seen the damage close up and seen both the physical and mental harm that these things have done. It has been a cause close to my heart. And to be able and to be recognized by Vera House as a white ribbon campaign chair was truly an honor. But remember, the people that have benefited the most have been the victims. And I hope these messages from me and others will inspire a future generation to continue to carry uh, the torch. But again, the people have truly benefited from all of Vera House's efforts have been the victims. Thank you. Vera House, thank you very much. I am proud to be a part of Vera House's Next Man Up. As a husband, a father, a son, and survivor of domestic violence, it's important for me to use my voice, my privilege, my resources to speak out against domestic violence and to speak up for those that have been left voiceless. Hello, my name is Tim Giruso, Foundation Trustee of Vera House, and I am committing to be Vera House's next man up, and I'd like to tell you why. Just over a year ago, on January 3rd, 2020, my friend Julie Baker, age 58, was murdered by a man she'd been in a relationship with for over 10 years. It was a classic case of an abusive relationship, of male dominance and a sense of entitlement that exploded into rage and murder. Vera House's White Ribbon Campaign challenges each of us as men to embrace cooperative and empowering dynamics in our relationship with women while exploring and eliminating patterns of discounting, devaluing, and abusing women in our lives and our community. This is what it means to me to develop and define a healthy model of masculinity. I'm inviting and challenging other men to do this work because as men, we can help create a world free of violence and abuse so that Julie's parents don't lose a daughter, that her six brothers don't lose a sister, that her three daughters don't lose a mom before they ever get a chance to get married. And so you don't lose a friend too. Please join me. Thank you. I am proud to be Vera House, next man up 
because during my years as an educator, as a teacher, as an administrator in the Syracuse City School District, I have seen many of our students, staff members, and some family members experience domestic violence. Vera House has been there to support our kids, to support our staff, and to support our families. So it is very important that we continue to support the work that Vera House is doing in our community to reduce or eliminate domestic violence. I'm proud to be Vera House's next man up because a world free of violence and abuse comes down to one word, and that's respect. So I'm challenging all men to have respect for the partners that you were with. I'm proud to be one of Vera House's next man up. As a husband, a father to three daughters, and a Vera House board member. The work that Vera House is doing in the community is paving the way to healthy relationships and a world free of violence and abuse. I pledge to never support, commit, or remain silent about abuse. I invite my friends, colleagues, and family members to be a next man up. There's no excuse for abuse. Hi, I'm Mayor Ben Walsh, and I am proud to be Vera House's next man up because being a real man means showing everyone decency and respect, and it means holding other men accountable to do the same. So please, join me. Be Vera House's next man up, and let's show everyone what a world without abuse and violence looks like. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sean Kirst. I'm a columnist for the Buffalo News. Spent a lot of my career and my life in greater Syracuse. I'm proud to be the next man up for Vera House, which has done such remarkable work in uh, the larger community. I'm well into my 60s now, and I've, I've had the, you know, the chance to witness the kind of generational damage that is done by domestic violence. You know, not only physical violence, but emotional violence, ridicule and condescension, and more than anything, the damage done by contempt. And it is just so important for healing and, and, and to stop this sort of generational sequence of, of harm and damage and hurt that, that, is, that is done by this kind of violence to see the work that Vera House is doing and to embrace it. I'm so grateful for what they've done for all of us and, and, and for people who are suffering. And I'm just really proud and, and, and fortunate to be part of this campaign and part of this message. Hi, my name is Marissa Saunders, and I am honored to be the very first woman up for Vera House's White Ribbon Campaign. This campaign for me is important because I was once a victim and now I'm a survivor of both domestic and sexual violence. The White Ribbon Campaign, it brings awareness and education to the men in our community about what positive male masculinity looks like. And for me, this campaign talks all about and redefines what love is supposed to look like and feel like in our hearts and in our minds and in our community. Together, we can make a difference and we can change and ensure that our community is free from violence. I hope each and every one of you are inspired by the messages you've heard tonight. We ask that you all take the lead of all of those who just shared their truths and take the step to be the next man up or next person up in the fight to end domestic and sexual violence. Whether you donate on a white ribbon fundraising page, purchase and display white ribbon merchandise, or sign on to become a white ribbon champion, you're stepping up and sending a clear message. There is no excuse for abuse. You can find links in the chat box for all of the ways you can get involved with the White Ribbon Campaign. We thank you. On behalf of all of us, I'm George Kilpatrick. Good night.